To be among the ranks of the undead is to be cursed. Most undead creatures will find themselves bound in service as a literal zombie or some kind of mindless creature forced to exact the will of whatever being raised them or in some cases whatever natural force caused them to become undead in the first place. Fewer still will hold on to some semblance of their personality and you might be able to tell that at one point this undead creature was someone. And even fewer still manage to hang on to not only just their personality traits but also their mind and in fact cross that threshold into undeath with everything going on upstairs still mostly intact. Welcome to Monster of the Week. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be talking about the Kurubozu. This creature originally came to be as a yokai, a mythical creature from Japanese legend. Apparently first making headlines in a newspaper at some point in the late 1800s, this creature was allegedly a monster that crept into people's houses in the night and fed on their breath, literally. Now as far as where it came to be used in tabletop role-playing games, it was originally brought to us in Pathfinder, actually. And of course, building on the themes of it stealing breath and it being an undead monstrosity that happened to be a monk, the Kurobozu was born as an initial stat block. So today we're going to talk about just what these breath-stealing monks are actually capable of in combat and some really interesting plot hooks for how you might want to use them in your fantasy tabletop game. But first things first, let's take a look at some... So the first thing we need to talk about before we can get into why this creature behaves the way it does in combat is its origin. See, a Kurobozu does not just happen to become what it is based on some random undead summoning. It is the product of a monk being raised into undeath. Not just a regular monk, usually it's a monk who's been disgraced either by their own actions or some kind of circumstance. So if you have a monk who say belongs to a very protective organization of zealous warriors that is kind of in charge of keeping evil forces at bay from attacking say a small mountain town or something like that and then one of those monks were to then side with the enemy and was consequently killed in battle literally destroying the people they were supposed to protect that monk would very likely rise as a Kurobozu. And as I alluded to earlier, they keep a lot of that monistic training as part of their core when they rise. They still have most of their mind and memories intact, and that includes how they fight. So like many monks, they can make several attacks, up to four with their fists or feet or however you want to flavor that in one round. And in addition to this causing a pretty substantial amount of damage, any target hit by one of their melee attacks also needs to make a wisdom saving throw or possibly be stunned until the monk's next turn. And as if that wasn't bad enough, anytime a creature fails that save and gets stunned, they also lose one point of wisdom from their wisdom score. Ability damage is pretty uncommon in 5th edition, but essentially it just affects all of the stats that are determined by wisdom and it takes a long time for that reduced stat to come back. I believe it's at a rate of one point per long rest. So if you take several hits from this thing and you're not good at wisdom saves, you're gonna have a rough time recovering from that. So being stunned in combat is obviously horrible, but the worst part about it in this situation is that the Kurobozu has a way to capitalize on that stunning effect. On its turn, if there are any creatures stunned around it, it is then able to use its Steel Breath ability on that stunned creature. They can also use this against a creature who's sleeping or otherwise unaware and incapacitated. In this case, the target has to make a constitution saving throw, and if it fails that, it gains a level of exhaustion. Not only is it potentially exhausted, but its breath reeks of carrion, which is just a bad thing to have happen to you and it exposes it to the Kurobozu's black epoxia disease, which is a disease that manifests within this creature and it kind of carries with it. And if a creature does contract this disease, it's not gonna be aware of it right away. Aside from the stinking breath, it, there's not really any symptoms. However, when that creature goes down to finally take a long rest, when it wakes up or comes out of its trance, whatever it happens to be doing, elves are weird, it will, instead of becoming fully rested, gain a level of exhaustion. Now, I mean, it will still heal back any hit points it would have lost and all that stuff, but more importantly, it's more tired than it was when it went to sleep. Now, it is granted an opportunity to save against this disease every day after that, right before it takes a long rest, 
But given a long enough period of time, if you fail a few saves, you're going to have a dead party member on your hands. It also doesn't help that once you've reached a certain level of exhaustion, you're rolling those saves with disadvantage, which makes sense, but it's still brutal. So even if your players are victorious in the encounter with this creature, they might still have a larger issue on their hands that they have to address. Couple that with this creature's malevolent intelligence, its incredible speed, and many resistances due to the fact that it's undead, it's a pretty dangerous creature to throw at a party. Even just one of these things could wreak havoc on the wrong group of adventurers. And speaking of wreaking havoc on adventurers, let's take a second and talk about some... So as I mentioned, these creatures are the ultimate byproduct of dishonorable monks who died in a state of disgrace when it comes to their vows that they took with their monastery. I feel like there's a ton of room just within that framework alone to kind of build a really interesting villain that you could use in a whole bunch of different situations. I mean, of course, there's the classic monk who was supposed to be good, turns evil for power or money or whatever dies in the process and then comes back as this creature that's great you can just use it as a standalone villain if there's a way for you to fit that sort of narrative into your game but another thought i had was that being a monk doesn't automatically make you a good person i mean there are definitely monkish orders that exist within canon D D settings that are definitely considered evil I mean, you could be an evil monk that reveres some kind of demonic god or an evil monk that belongs to some kind of horrible cult. That doesn't make you not a monk. It just makes you not a good monk. So, I mean, you could have one of these things arise if it were going against its own order that was an evil order as well. I mean, the Kurobozu is still kind of an evil and undead creature. It wouldn't necessarily be a good guy, but it could be a really interesting NPC to incorporate into a campaign. Very much the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of situation. Just don't tell the paladin that he's undead. Or if you're playing more of a light-hearted game, you could absolutely have one of these kind of vile, undead-looking creatures be a good, aligned PC who's maybe a reformed member of this evil cult that was cursed in this way because he went against the vows that he took to some god, but now wants to help the players destroy the cult, not only because he thinks it's the right thing to do, but maybe in doing that it will release him from his curse of undeath. But traditionally, these guys are very evil and there's kind of this whole thing where they're often jealous of other monks that are still alive and kind of in good standing with their order so if you have a monk in your party it would be really interesting to kind of throw in a kurobozu as a specific antagonist to that character i mean ultimately they'd be against the party but they're against the party because that monk is traveling with them it could even be a disgraced member of that monk's same order who hates them just because of who they are and wants to kill them or disrupt their plans. It's also not unprecedented to have one of these creatures align itself with a monk who has turned against their order as well. So maybe you have a monk who's still alive but has turned against their order and decided they're going to betray them for power or greed or whatever, and a Kurobozu can kind of appear and say, hey, I understand what you're doing and why, let me help you, and kind of offer itself up as almost a mentor. Seeing as it walked the same path during life and failed, let me show you where I failed so that you can succeed in destroying your order. Or maybe they're even from the same order and this Kurobozu died a thousand years ago trying to do what this monk is now trying to do in the current time. Or if you want to take some inspiration from Sekiro and get all from software about it, Maybe this monk belongs to an order of monks who is actively trying to pursue immortality through undeath. And maybe this monk hasn't abandoned their order as it is now, but perhaps the entire order has abandoned whatever gods they followed or whatever creed they walked and are now pursuing this kind of dream that is impossible of never dying. Because as we all know, undeath isn't really immortality. It's just not death. But in a place like that, a Kurobozu would be a very flavorful encounter and not an easy one either. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could take this creature and expand on it and maybe add some more of the monk's abilities to the stat block so it kind of feels more like a boss fight. If you have these guys kind of as the general monks in the place that your characters are adventuring through, and then a couple really powerful ones who are like the leaders of their order that have some more abilities and that kind of stuff could be really interesting. 
But in any case, that is pretty much all I have to say about the Kuro Bozu. I think they are very fascinating creatures. I think we can always use more interesting forms of undead. So this is both of them. If you do want to use this creature in your D&D 5th edition game, you can find the stat block and everything you'll need to run it in the description below in the form of a Google document there. Uh, if you are one of my fantastic patrons, you can find the full kind of monster manual style stat block on the Patreon page right there. And while you're looking at all those links, you can find me on Discord, Twitter, Reddit, all that fun stuff. And as always, I do just want to say thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I will see you in the next video. Until then.